Good afternoon and welcome to this wonderful day in Columbia, South Carolina. A beautiful day in Columbia, South Carolina for a change. Uh, and thank you for being here to join us at Columbia Rotary Club. We'll begin our meeting today with music by Rusty DePass and Audrey Van Brown. <laughs>
Thank you, uh, President John. Um, it looks like we have uh, one busy Rotary today, uh, Alex Chapman. If you're here, could you stand up, Alex, please? There you go in the back from uh, Columbia East. And I had two, two Rotarians actually right now. They had guests, and that's Holt, uh, Chetwood, and Carl Roberts. But if you could please stand up with your guests and introduce them, we'd greatly appreciate it. Thank you, I'm Carl Roberts, and I'm very happy to have with me today my son Brendan, who is a grad student at Caltech. Good afternoon, I'm Holt Chetwood, and I am privileged to have my friend Lala Anna Souls. Lala Anna and I have known each other for a number of years. She's the CEO of St. Lawrence Place, which is a homeless uh, shelter for families and provide them education and rehabilitation. Uh, she and her husband Brad are the parents of five boys, not five children, but five boys, Blake. And uh, so she's very busy with that and has also found time to run for Richland School Board number one. And uh, I'm very grateful that she has, as I have children in the district, and know she'll provide great leadership there. So I would ask you to consider her in 15 days. governor and he's living in Charleston in the Charleston area now and has been funded for the day so Bill we're glad you're here thank you Something funny, which I really 
Kent usually do. I'm not a very good joke teller. But I will just tell you a little bit, since we're so many, uh, since this club loves the Walford Terriers so much, um, that we had probably the best and most entertaining game, even though we lost, but the Citadel this weekend. Because how many Citadel alumni in here? Hey. Any of y'all go to the game? Hey, it's only 90 minutes up the road. Come on. It was, it was a great game. Of course, the Citadel's undefeated this year, doing very well. Uh, but it was also the first uh, year that we got to go back as alumni where the fraternity houses had been changed. And uh, so we got to see the new digs and had a good time. Um, Milton and, and I were one of only two people in the whole state smoking cigars, so we we're carrying on the Rotary tradition well. Um, Walford put it on us to raise a lot of money, so one of the things they wanted us to do was, was uh, buy bricks. And so I'll just leave you with what I put on my brick. Uh, practice grace at campus pace. Uh, the idea being be, be nice to people and don't get too worked up about it. It's all okay. Thank you. Have a great day. Okay. Um, most of you know that we have uh, an opportunity several times a year for Rotarians to get together on a casual basis and play some golf. And there may be some of you who have graduated who, who haven't been active in our little friendly golf outing um, because you're too busy. And you may have now graduated into a time in your life where you have a few hours available on a Friday afternoon occasionally that you might want to join us. And I'm sure we have some new members who play golf but may not be on our email list. So we have about 40 people who want to be uh, notified from time to time of these little golf outings. And there may be others of you who would like to be included in that list. So if there's some who uh, would like to join us occasionally, we're shooting right now for uh, Friday afternoon, November the 18th for a friendly round of golf uh, with ourselves and uh, you can bring a guest if you like or another Rotarian. Uh, it's a lot of uh, fun and fellowship for Rotarians and I would uh, suggest if you don't have anything to do on Friday afternoon the 18th, uh, get in touch with me so I can include you in the group and uh, get it all set up. So you can either email me or uh, catch me after the meeting, whatever, if you'd like to be added to that list. I also want to note uh, that you will see on your table a save the date card. Uh, and that save the date card is the first public announcement of our celebration for our 100th year uh, festivity on December 9th. Uh, we are really hoping that every one of you will be able to make that. Uh, Bill Fanny told me he's going to try to come up from Charleston that evening and join us. Uh, so if Bill can come all the way from Charleston, uh, hopefully all of you can drive across town and come to the convention center on Friday evening and night uh, and join us. I will tell you that there is a typo on that card, unfortunately. It's a small typo, but our Rotary International President's name is John Germ, G-E-R-M. And unfortunately, we printed it G-E-R-N on that uh, on that card. So please don't let the international president see that card when he gets here. <laughs> uh, we, we might be embarrassed. Ann says that everybody in the district is going to be calling her now and telling her that we messed it up. So um, anyway, uh, that card did go out to the district. Uh, we're, in, we're inviting all uh, club leaders from across our district to join us that evening. And I think there will be, uh, I'm going to guess, 100 people or more from around the district who will also join us that evening. So. I think it'll be a lot of fun, and it is quite an exceptional opportunity for us to have the Rotary International President here for a club function. That's uh, almost unheard of uh, in Rotary. So we'll look forward to that. I hope that you will take that color home, share it with your wife and, and, or spouse, whichever that is, uh, and uh, get, that, uh, get that on your family calendar if you want. <laughs> Yeah. What is the event? Dinner? It's a dinner event. It is. It is. It's. Uh, it will start at six. Uh, we'll have a cocktail reception, and then uh, dinner after that uh, at around seven. 
and then a program after that. So uh, that's, uh, and it'll be a wonderful dinner. Uh, and we obviously are uh, uh, doing this as a special event for the club. Uh, and, we, and we have a really, I think we have a great evening planned for you. So I think everyone will have a good time and be proud of their club uh, after, uh, after that event is over. So uh, we'll, we'll keep pounding you with information. This is the first shot out of the barrel, and we'll, uh, we'll keep, keep you updated as we progress with that. Hey, John. Yes. Is there a sign-up, or do we just let you know? We, we will. There will be an invitation going out shortly, and there will be an RSVP opportunity on that invitation. And I think maybe the invitation will go out for about a week or so. Uh, so you'll have the opportunity not only to sign in uh, or sign up, but to order, uh, order your dinner as well, so uh, on that. And there will be, uh, for those of you who may be in, there will be a private reception uh, at 5.30 with the Rotary International President for those people who are major donors uh, to the Rotary Foundation. And that is either a past donor or someone who wishes to become a major donor uh, at, uh, prior to that reception. You'll be invited to the private reception uh, with the Rotary International President John Jerome. So that, that part of it will start at 5.30. Uh, and I hope those of you who are already uh, major donors will be there uh, and attend that reception. And those of you who are thinking about doing that, it would be a good time to make that move if you would like to, uh, to become a major donor to the Foundation. So at this point in time, uh, in keeping with an effort uh, on my part to try to introduce all of us to as many of our members as we can during this Rotary year. I am very pleased to introduce to you Judge Carolyn Matthews, a fairly recent member of our club. Uh, she was introduced to our club by Doc Ryle, and thank you, Doc, for bringing this lovely lady to us. Uh, but I would like to have uh, Judge Matthews come up and introduce herself to the club. Stevenson quote that I genuinely uh, love. And so I think the initial inquiry is how do we define ourselves? What are we? I'm very fortunate I was born in Columbia, South Carolina, the oldest of four girls, had parents who adored me and grandparents, all of whom told me I could become anything I wanted to be. I've often thought of starting a support group for people who really did have father knows best growing up and who had, you know, people who told them they were so wonderful that they never found that again. So it always seems to be the reverse when you hear about support groups. But I was very fortunate. I went to Heathwood Hall Episcopal School because my birthday was late, November 8th. And so that's where we started. It was only six grades then at Heathwood. And um, I'm dating myself by saying that, but so is my face. So. Um, <laughs> anyway, I, I was told as an oldest grandchild of eight, what would be 18 grandchildren that every word I said basically was golden. So it made me, shall we say, loquacious. Some might say verbose. Um, it meant that the first day at Heathwood Hall, I had to stand in the corner for talking too much. And I was like, moi. I mean, no one had ever told me to be quiet or that everything I said might not be perfect. But I was fortunate, I was educated at Creighton, at AC Flora, wonderful education, and then went to Furman University, where I was privileged to study at the University of London and um, at the Shakespeare Institute for a full semester. Uh, it was a marvelous experience to see a lot of Shakespeare plays and to be a 19-year-old in England and in Europe at the time when everything was safe and you could hitchhike with anybody and no one came to any ill. It was a great time. And I was lucky because in high school I had gotten to travel on a trip with what was called the American International Academy. And it was $485 total, including airfare, all meals, everything, for four weeks in Europe. They only lasted about two years, and you can see why. 
Um, but to somebody from Columbia, South Carolina, to be exposed to a museum like the Pinatotec in, in Munich, or to see the David when you're 16, you know, you have something that goes with the Renaissance in your mind, and it inspired a lifelong um, love of travel. But I think one thing that has characterized me as much as my verbosity would be my, um, I have a decent sense of humor, and I find much of life funny, which is, is a good thing. Um, I remember when I was uh, five months pregnant, I was interviewing for a job at the Supreme Court as the first female staff attorney there. And I was told I would interview the court. I thought that meant Chief Justice Woodrow Lewis, who was the Chief Justice. And I walked into the room in my quicky little high heels across the parquet floor with my skirt unzipped half the way down the back because I was five months pregnant and I didn't want them not to hire me because of that. Terrified my skirt's going to fall on the floor. I walk in there and there are all five of them. And I realized, I know there's Bubba Ness is one of them, and I know the other names, but I don't know what faces go with what. So I just, all I can think of was good afternoon, gentlemen. And of course they began asking me all the questions you cannot ask a woman who is pregnant. Judge Ness looked at me and said, I understand you're going to have a baby. And I said, yes sir I am. What you going to do when that baby comes? How are you going to do this job? I did not point out to them that Title IX did not allow him to ask him this question. <laughs> These are men my father's age and they have my future in their hands. So, I said, well, sir, I've you know, arranged for child care and I have someone coming in my room and I was very, you know, objective and focused about it. He looked at me and he said, you know, my secretary had her baby on the lunch hour. <laughs> Yeah, I bet she gathered the wagons in a circle afterwards and bought off Indians, too. <laughs> what have I done? I have sat there and been a smart aleck to five men who hold my future in the hand. Well, I was very lucky. There were 81 people applying for that job, and I don't know how, but I got it. So it was a great place to start, and um, after that, I went uh, to the Attorney General's office, where I was fortunate enough to practice law with Carl Roberts, and be at the uh, Attorney General's office, and we do criminal appeals. And in that capacity, I argued approximately 80 cases before the Supreme Court. There was no court appeals in. And the most famous would have been uh, upholding the conviction of Donald Henry P.B. Gaskins, who was the state's most notorious mass murderer. That was intriguing. And after that, I went to work at the um, House Judiciary Committee for David Wilkins and learned a lot about legislation and legislators. And then I went to Nelson Mullins Riley in Scarborough um, because I was broke, and I was a single parent at the time, and my husband and I had divorced, and I needed to make some money. And I became a partner there. And uh, after that, I decided I wanted to be a member of the judiciary. So I tried to get some more litigation experience, and I went up to the General Assembly and started campaigning. Any of you who have done that know how exhilarating and humiliating it is. <laughs> and you best keep a sense of humor. And I think we've become far too serious in our environment because Example, like I remember one legislator, I can mention his name because I, I go crazy about him and his wife, Joan Land, who was there for many years. And he came up to me in his classic drawl and said, Calvin, you win that election, what you going to wear under that robe? I said, and I, I said, John Chanel number no. five. Well, I got that. <laughs> the reality is, you know when they're kidding and when they're not, and I think we've become far too ridiculous about what is harmless banter, if you will, turning into something that's a lawsuit. Um, and the reason I joined Rod Rotary is because of Dot Rowell. And I have read that coincidence is God's way of remaining anonymous. And Dot and I were having our car service, and she just started talking to me about life in general and about Rotary. And um, she has become a good friend of mine and uh, convinced me to enjoy something that has meant so much to her in her life. Uh, she's a great ambassador for Rotary. And why did I join? Because Rotarians have to what appears to be a local, <coughs> state, and international um, passion and be invested in all of those things. So I think we're all in the process of becoming what we're capable of becoming. And I would like to see the acronym TFGB become as important as some of the others. Truth, fairness, goodwill, and beneficial. So that's why I'm Rotarian. Thank you very much. Watch a speaker that walks off with your agenda. I've had that happen to me several times. Thank you, Carol. 
Isn't it nice to have a judge with a sense of humor? I mean, that is real. That's amazing. So, speaking of agendas, um, you probably didn't notice, or maybe you didn't notice, I made a mistake last week. And it wasn't my first mistake, and it didn't go be my last mistake uh, while I'm up here trying to do this for you for this year. Um, the agenda got kind of dicey uh, last week. A couple things ran over, tried to squeeze too many things in, and I inadvertently skipped over health and happiness last week. And Regina Brown, who was sitting over there, I think has maybe left, uh, but anyway, I wanted to apologize to her uh, in front of these many witnesses for my mistake last week. Uh, certainly, uh, uh, was one of those things I regretted greatly, greatly because I'm sure she prepared uh, well to present uh, to present that her health and happiness to you last week. So I apologize to her. Wanted to do it personally, but it looks like she may have left her. Um, so. We'll move along here to introduce our speaker today. Uh, Alicia Connors will introduce uh, our speaker for you today. Hello, everybody. Um, I'd like to keep on with this great attitude of sports and football. And I have one thing to say. How about those mountaineers? Number two, I'm in a room of SEC, SEC fans, but the Big 12 does exist, people. <laughs> okay, um, Carrie had mentioned that I might want to introduce myself properly. I am Alicia Connors, Director of Placement with Gallman Consulting. We are the executive placement firm for Gallman Personnel Services. Gallman Personnel Services has been providing temporary staffing solutions to South Carolina for the past 30 years. And we also have an office in Arkansas and Arizona. So having said that, um, my love for West Virginia is because I'm born and raised. Born and raised a mountaineer, moved 11 times in 23 years with my ex-husband and my four children, who are my greatest achievements. Um, my oldest is 25 years old. She's the MMA fighter that randomly you hear about here, who is also about to have her second pro fight in Kansas City, Missouri, November the 18th, UFC Fight Pass. Please watch. Um, my son is Nick. He's 23, graduate of College Charleston, is now attending the Citadel, taking classes towards getting his teaching degree. And then God blessed me 10 years after that with two teenagers who are trying to kill me. They are 14 and 15. I'm jaded. And when I show up here, understand that I want to get to know you, but it's also my break. Okay? Bear with me. Um, thank you very much for giving me the honor to introduce our guest today. Matmu Ba. He is the Acting Vice President, Department Administration and Finance, and Chief Financial Officer of the Millennium Child Corporation. As Acting Vice President and CFO, Matmu has is responsible for the agency's financial management. He oversees the human resources and information technology divisions and represents the administration and finance on the agency's investment management committee. Whew. That's a lot. Um, Montmute has nearly 20 years of experience in financial management and accounting in both public and private sectors. Before joining the MCC, he worked in public accounting, corporate financial management, and forensic accounting. Montmute received his MBA from the University of Maryland, Robert H. Smith School of Business. He is a certified public accountant, certified fraud examiner. He also completed the leading economic growth executive education program at the Harvard Kennedy School of Government. Please join me in welcoming Matmu Ba. Thank you so much, Andrew. Um, I told my wife that I wouldn't mention anything about football today, but um, I think I will go ahead and respond to Alicia and uh, say as an agency that uh, pride itself with data, I would say the SEC is data driven. We should just look at the stats. Maybe that's why we talk too much about the SEC. <laughs> I am an Alabama fan, so no time. No time. <laughs> so um, good morning, and thank you so much uh, for taking time out of your busy day uh, to come and listening to us and uh, uh, give us the opportunity to talk to you a little bit about the Millennium Challenge Corporation. 
Uh, the Millennium Challenge Corporation is a small agency that was created back in 2004 by President Bush. Um, President Bush believed that uh, lifting people out of poverty is done through economic growth. Uh, he was a firm believer that uh, just as your mission states that it is our duty for those who have the opportunity to help those who don't. So uh, he created the agency with the mission of fighting economic growth, uh, fighting poverty, reducing extreme poverty to economic growth. Our, our, our mission, unlike uh, some of the large agencies that you know, USA, the State Department, and so on, is that our mission is focused on specific sectors. Um, USA, for instance, do, uh, they do focus on sectors such as uh, education, health, or humanitarian relief. But we are different. We do believe that uh, we have to target countries that are going to extreme poverty by looking at what is the constraint to economic growth in those countries. And how do you design projects that are in the long term sustainable and, and not just hand over money uh, and leave and then you fall through the cycle of poverty again. Uh, and at MCC, uh, we do the majority of our projects are targeted toward large-scale infrastructure. In, in most of the developing countries we're working in, that is usually the largest constraint to economic growth. So we spend 70% of our portfolio it's in water, clean water, uh, power, uh, we do some education, and we do a lot of roads. Our singular mission to to focus on economic growth has proven to be one of the most effective and long-lasting way to reduce poverty. We have a methodology that we use in selecting our countries, uh, going through a rigorous process of evaluating which are the projects that the country wants to implement, and we review those projects and make sure that they do return, in fact, economic growth to the beneficiaries. The beneficiaries of those uh, funds are the poorest of the countries that we work in. Uh, and data over the last two decades, it has been proven that, in fact, economic growth is trending in reducing poverty. Two thirds of the world's poorest have been lifted out of poverty over the last 20 years. And this, this trend con continues to, to, to go up. To maximize our impact, we follow key principles that is good governance. Uh, we cannot work with a country that does not have good governance. So from fighting uh, corruption to uh, pushing country to respect the rule of law, uh, we go through a scorecard to rate countries and then make them eligible for our program. On average, our grants uh, are around $350 million that are implemented over a five year period. We have to date committed close to $11 billion uh, since 2004. We have worked and affected in excess of 175 million people. So why, is, why, why are we here today and why do we want to talk to the Rotary Club of Columbia? I think that our missions are aligned I've sat here and i listened to everything that has been said today. It is definitely in, in parallel and aligned with what we do as an agency, trying to help the, the, the people that do not have the opportunity. But in doing that, we have to find methodologies and ways that is a win-win solution. Um, and I think uh, handing over money or handing over, uh, we do not do humanitarian, but there's a way to use the business community to really affect uh, global poverty. So MCC have now, uh, uh, over the last year, issued our next uh, strategy. It's our five-year strategic plan, <clears throat> which focuses really on key aspects of economic growth. We do, we, just to cite two, two examples, right now we are seeking a small legislative change uh, to allow us to more work regionally. So what do I mean by that is that we notice that when we select countries and we work in vacuum in these countries, we are really missing a big point, which is the fact that people, goods, and services move across borders. So by follow, our investments should follow those, those uh, uh, movements. Uh, we, we see a lot of opportunity by connecting markets. 
Uh, if you think about uh, West Africa or you think about places like the Philippines or Indonesia, uh, the, there are pockets of growth that are not being connected. And I think by connecting those pockets of growth, you do expand uh, uh, opportunities to lifting people out of poverty. So that's one. So for that, we are, allowed, uh, we are seeking a legislative change in Congress to get us what we call the regional uh, compact authority. The second is we do see the benefit of the private sector. Over, over the course of our existence, we've been in business for 12 years, we've seen how the private sector have really cemented some of the policy reforms that we have implemented in some of our countries, our partner countries. So one of the things that we do now is trying to go out and reach out to the business community in the U.S. and urge them to uh, pay attention to what we're doing, participate in our projects, and in that, it's through that, expand their markets. So the shift that we are talking about, uh, the second shift by uh, leveraging private sector, is really evident in some of the work we're doing in the power sector. Uh, the president has uh, pushed forward an initiative called Power Africa, which is really trying to electrify some of the darkest places in Africa, and in so doing, allowing businesses to grow and strive. And when businesses grow and strive, we do think that American businesses can have an opportunity to expand their markets. We have now honed in really on some policy, specific policy reforms in the power sector, uh, from uh, tariffs to uh, distribution and transmission of electricity, in order to help those countries really attract American businesses. Uh, I think the, the reality is businesses don't go places where they don't see uh, the risk reward as a balance for them to, to invest. So what role can you play? I think in general there is really a, a very negative perception of risk uh, in some of the markets that we operate in. Uh, in general, if you ask the typical American about Nigeria, for instance, they would think about fraud. Uh, because that's what they're exposed to. And businesses also do behave the same way. It's that they do see these high-risk markets. But the reality is there are also high opportunities in these countries, in these regions. So we do hope that when we go in a country and we push for policy change, uh, we push for uh, policy reform, it will attract businesses here and it will create jobs for us. The reality is when we go abroad and we deal in our project, most people love American products. They see the quality difference between American products and products made elsewhere, and notably China. So uh, that quality is something that is essential for us uh, expanding our market. When we do opportunities in the country, it's not necessarily based on price, it's based on value. So every year, uh, through our partner countries, we put out close to 400 competitive bids that are on average 450 million for the whole year. So I want to urge you to really focus and, and engage and participate in these opportunities uh, because you know, your business know-how is what really makes a big difference in some of the programs that we work in. I just want to give you a couple of examples. Uh, right now we are working on in Benin, uh, uh, from Benin to Indonesia, to Indonesia we are working on very large uh, contracts and bids that will probably in the next six months average about $100 million. These are focused a lot on the power sector. For, for example, uh, over the next five years, we are trying to we plan to invest about $850 million between the countries of uh, the West African countries of Benin and Ghana. Uh, we often release calls for ideas. We have done a call for ideas in Benin and, and have received significant uh, a number of uh, uh, ideas in the clean energy space. Every year we show an opportunity for American company to bid on our contract and we want you to participate. We're also paving the way for American companies to go global. I just want to uh, spend the time a little bit to tell you about a small company called Pike uh, uh, Corporation, which is uh, uh, in North Carolina. Uh, about six years ago, they bid on a project in Tanzania. And it's a very small company, and they want to bid for about $18 million contract, laying transmission and distribution lines. Uh, that was the first time they worked in Africa. Uh, and
and they had partnered with a company in Tanzania and really did a phenomenal job from a quality, time, and cost standpoint on delivering the project. So these are opportunities since then. Pike has now extended their reach globally, and they want to do more business uh, on the international space. Uh, the, the example for Pike is what we want to replicate because we do believe that the private sector has the know-how and has the, the right incentive. It's a win-win uh, for the private sector and for the poor people of the countries that we, uh, we operate in. Again, I want to take this opportunity to thank you. Uh, and uh, we are, I have a couple of colleagues here, uh, Preston Winters from the procurement group, and we can answer any question that you may have after this. Thank you very much. Take a couple of questions if you have some. Uh, you said that there are a large population, a number of countries that have been lifted out of poverty. How do you find that? Can you give us an example? Yeah, so um, the World Bank uh, and some of the institutions that we work with publish every year uh, a lot of statistics about poverty. Uh, one of the statistics that the, the publish is that this, they, they look at the world and classify the countries by what we call low income, medium income, upper middle income countries. And every year you see countries which GNI, the gross, the gross national income, growing. And those statistics allow us to say that countries, you can see, it comes out every year, you can see that a lot of the poor countries have really been rising out of poverty. Those are really countries that have been growing significantly. If you, even if you take countries like, uh, uh, just a wild example, like China, you know, those are countries that 40, 50 years ago were not at the same GNI as today. Uh, you go to West Africa, the growth that is happening in West Africa is tremendous. Uh, the technology companies will tell you, telecom will tell you, a huge market for cell phones today is in Africa. Uh, because the, the level of poverty, which is, which is amazing, is that you will go in the most remote places in West Africa, you will see women in market with cell phones. These are people who've never been to school, but they know how to use the cell phone, they know how to connect their vendors, their suppliers. So over time, we've seen really empirical data that uh, over the last 10 decades, two-thirds of the GNI has really lifted uh, and, and a lot of countries are moving up into the, uh, what we call the lower middle income countries. Where does your funding come from? It comes from you. Uh, so taxpayers. So we are funded by Congress. Uh, we're very small. We get about an appropriation of $900 million a year. Through the Department of Commerce? No, we are independent. We are we, we report directly to the uh, House Foreign Affairs Committee. Uh, and we are uh, our board is chaired by the Secretary of State. Yes. You mentioned a focus on Africa. Are you also active in the Western Hemisphere in the Americas? Yes, we are. We are um, we are focused in uh, Latin America. We are in Southeast Asia. So we have a program in El Salvador. The reality is our programs get scored every year. So once a country start going through certain difficulties, we tend to, uh, they, when they don't pass our scorecards, we cannot select them. But yeah, we are in uh, the Americas, and then we are in the Philippines, Indonesia, Sri Lanka, and so on. Yes? How many employees and where are you located? So we are in Washington, D.C. We are limited by Congress to not exceed 300 people. So there are 300 full-time employees that work for our agencies. But the majority of our money and presence is overseas. So what I mean by that is we have this model called country-led program. So every country we work in, we allow two full-time employees to be there. And the program has to be run by the country. So we try to put in place certain controls uh, so that the money is dispersed properly, but we want to have a very light uh, presence and let them uh, implement the program with our oversight, of course. Uh, some of your statistics probably have made their way into the American Enterprise Institute and the work that they do because they uh, 
referenced about over the last 20 years, how many have been lifted out of poverty. My question is, and this started under President Bush, free market kind of presidency, has it grown under President Obama? Was it embraced to continue it? What was the response of, of the Obama administration to doing the same sort of thing? Great, great question. I think, um, so it is no doubt that this is a good idea. Uh, that uh, the president had, uh, President Bush that is, uh, at the same time he was fighting uh, terrorists around the world, he said that, you know, we have to be smart about going to these places after they are completely messed up. Uh, so the idea of trying to lift countries out of poverty while they are stable uh, was really novel. And the president, President Obama, had embraced the same idea. And, and frankly, in Congress, we do enjoy a bipartisan support uh, because the Republicans see this as efficient. Uh, it's not too much money. It's not throwing a lot of money at the problem to try to solve it. And the Democrats also see this as really the social aspect of it. It's something that they support. So yeah, we do, we do enjoy uh, a bipartisan support. And they really like the model being lean and small and not grow a huge bureaucracy. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Yes. One more. You've right. said twice that you're a small federal agency, but the title has corporation in it, which makes me think of private sector. Yeah. It seems incongruent. No, actually, it's um, by design done this way. So uh, President Bush didn't want another federal agency. He wanted it to operate exactly like a business private sector corporation. So while we are a federal agency, we have our statute, we do operate like a corporation. So we have a board of directors chaired by the Secretary of State. And we have four private we have nine members, including our CEO, and four private members. So decisions are debated within that board and, and approved. And our approvals go to Congress for what we call a congressional notification. So yes, but it, it does seem a little bit uh, uh, weird to have a federal agency be a corporation, but it is not unusual if you think about the FDIC, for instance, uh, who's also uh, um, a corporation. But so we do, we want to, we try to really take a lot from the private sector and try to just still be, since we are funded by taxpayers, we still have to report to Congress and be abide by federal rules and regulations. Who appoints the board members? Who appoints? Sorry. Board members. Who appoints the board members? Oh, the, so the board members, so we have ex officials that, for instance, the five board members, I, have, I mentioned nine. So there are five that are immediately appointed due to their position the Secretary of State, the USTDR, our yeah. trade representative, the, the administrator of the USA. And then the other, uh, the CEO is a board member. And then the other private board members are vetted by Congress and the Senate. Uh, but they must be from the private sector. Yes, yes sir. Uh, so do you receive nine hundred and million every year from Congress? Uh, on, on average, yes. So we get that appropriation, but we have to, we do not spend, we, we have what we call a no year fund. So we don't have the incentive to want to spend money because we want to spend it. So Congress allows us to spend it only when we find an opportunity that return uh, uh, that has an economic rate of return above our hurdle rate, which is 10%. Thank you. Yes. Uh, seems like every five years we're reminded that Haiti just cannot climb out of poverty. Can they? Do they qualify for? Or? Unfortunately, Haiti is not in our program because of the political situation and the, uh, what I mentioned is the governance model. We, I mean, it's really unfortunate to see Haiti in the situation it is in, but unfortunately we have our goals. Uh, so I know they need the money, they need the help, but we do believe our model will not work in Haiti because the governance is not there yet. nice to keep learning about things we didn't know anything about. I never heard of this agency before and obviously they do a lot of good work. 
And it's also nice to hear that there really is an opportunity to have a small federal government agency, only 300 employees. I mean, that's remarkable uh, in terms of our government. And the fact uh, that they only spent $11 billion of our money seems like a lot of money, but I guess in terms of large agencies, that's just a little bit of money, right? It's one billion, not 11, one billion. No, it was 11. 11 since 2004. 11 since 2004. They've spent $11 billion, about a billion a year. Uh, but it's really nice to know that there is an agency that is being properly governed uh, by a board that just doesn't let it grow out of control. And thank you for doing what you do uh, and not only managing the assets of our country well, but for helping those who uh, around the world who need your help. And small memento of thanks. Oh, thank you, sir. Yeah. I hope you paid attention to one of the things he said, one of the first things he said about um, infrastructure, how important infrastructure is in some of these countries. Uh, and it, it allows the country to come out of poverty, but they've got to have the infrastructure first. And one of the first things he mentioned was clean water. And clean water is one of the things that Rotary International is focused on. Uh, and one of the things that we may as a club get involved in in the coming years. So uh, we all understand how important, you understand how important clean water is uh, in terms of allowing the country to come out of poverty. And, and our, our organization, Rotary International, does a lot of that around the world. So we can be proud of being your partner uh, in that area. Um, Okay, Carrie, you want to tell us about next week's? Yes, uh, we have Richland County Solicitor Dan Johnson next week, and then um, mark your calendars for the 14th because we've got um, General Johnson from um, Fort Jackson. Yes, and Fort Jackson is celebrating their 100th anniversary with us, so we'll have the general here to talk about what they're doing for their uh, 100th anniversary as well. So I. John, I know we've talked about it before, but would you remind everyone about the dedication for Jack Dandelion? Oh, yes, yes, absolutely. Um, there is a statue. Uh, Amy, would you like to talk about that just briefly? Sure. Yeah. On um, Friday, November 11th, the Five Points Association is celebrating our centennial uh, with a two-part plaza. One part is a uh, our third water feature in Five Points. That's what we do best. And then the other part of the plaza is a bronze statue of Colonel Jack Van Lowe. Uh, he is a big part of what we do in Five Points, but this is specifically to honor him and his dedication to our country. So the Rotary Club is partnering with us, um, along with some other uh, partners. The uh, City of Columbia has generously contributed to Richland County, and we are unveiling the plaza on Veterans Day, 3 o'clock. You're all invited. Uh, if you would like more information, please let me know. So that's November 11th, right? Three o'clock in Five Points. Um, and t tell us exactly where in Five Points the, the statue is going to be. It's at the intersection of Blossom, Congaree, and Santee Avenue. So if you're on Blossom, um, going away from the Strong or um, USC's campus and going towards Shannon, it's on the right between TD Bank and T-Mobile Boulevard. Um, if you drive by right now, it looks like a mess because of construction. We're reworking the curb lines um, and changing up the, the turn into that neighborhood, slow down traffic. It would be wonderful to have a few of our members there Monday to honor Jack. Uh, so we'll, uh, I certainly will be there. Now, uh, neglected in health and happiness, uh, Jack asked me to mention that the uh, bell ringing uh, still needs captains. And since he asked me to do it, anybody that wants to be on my team, Friday, December 6th. Unfair, unfair. Actually, <laughs> All right, don't forget bell ringing, right, Jack? Don't forget bell ringing. He needs captains. He needs day captains, right? Yes. Captain for a day. Okay. Um, I guess we'll end. Uh, we have a piano player and a lead singer, so we'll end in song today. Thank you.